morning and happy Sabbath to all of you viewers out there and also to the Mount Calvary Seventh-day Adventist group for which I'm streaming live today. Thank you for the invite. Just before we start, I would just like to urge you that everybody that offerings and tithe through the EFT system as provided through the church, please let's not forgive, forget to give during this time, even though we may be housebound during this period of lockdown in South Africa, there's still God's work that needs to be Today we are going to be talking about the frontal lobe, stress, anxiety, depression, and also a little bit about the neurological factors that affect our frontal lobes and how it affects our decision making. And what we find is that in this worldwide lockdown, if I may, in this worldwide chaos right now, when no one seems to know exactly what is going to happen, we need to understand that we need God more than ever. With that, may we ask the Lord to join us in prayer. Lord, I pray that you may watch over us, may guide us, help us to make proper decisions out there, Lord Jesus, for you, especially in this time of a world war. We might even be questioning your lordship and your kingship right now, Lord Jesus. But help us through this time. Help us through your strength and your mercy. We pray this in your name. Amen. In Psalms, Psalms 34 and verse 19, the verse says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. The one thing that we as Christians and even the whole world needs to understand is that regardless of what afflictions are happening right now, the Lord will deliver us. We need to have that trust. We need to have that faith. Unfortunately, especially with this coronavirus outbreak, what we find is that many people are taking that trust that should be put on the Lord and they are taking it upon themselves. One example, in fact, is the worldwide reports of all these issues of panic buying and how people are acting irrationally and how people are acting out of fear. One of the reasons for that is that, one, they, might, they have no idea what is coming, so they have this fear of the unknown. They don't know, will this coronavirus get sorted out? We hope that it do. We hope that it does. Uh, people have that hope, but yet they still trust themselves to build up and hoard for the future. Not placing the trust in where it should be placed, on the shoulders of the Lord. Whereas the verse that I just read now, coming from Psalms, says that the Lord shall deliver us out of all these afflictions that are falling upon us. So the question is, why do we... Not only as God's people, but as everybody out there, why do we make these types of decisions that are at best irrational and at worst dangerous to ourselves and to other people? Why would normal, a normal human being make a decision out of fear? Why, why would they make these types of decisions that have no basis in fact? But it's as if we're just acting on impulse. What I would like to present to you today is that it comes partly because of our frontal lobe. It comes partly because our frontal lobes are deficient. And we have depressed the functioning of our frontal lobes in many instances. And we'll go through some of those reasons today. It comes in part not only from biological factors, but also environmental factors, chemical factors, in part even to our DNA. But a large part of why our frontal lobe is depressed is because of what we are doing to ourselves, what we are putting ourselves through, what we are eating, what we are drinking, how we live our lives, 
how we sleep, how we wake, how we spend our waking hours. All of those things has an influence in terms of what it does to either build up or break down our frontal lobe. If we turn our attention to one of the more famous stories in the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 19, <clears throat> we find a story where Elijah has just come off from one of the most famous victories in the Bible. In fact, one of the most famous victories ever. But yet, when we read 1 Kings chapter 19, we find that through one command, through one authoritative being or person giving him an instruction to say, this will happen to you. You will die by this time tomorrow. Just by that one sentence, we find Elijah completely overtaken by fear. I mean, Jezebel didn't even give the threat to him in person. It was given by a messenger. But that one threat alone made Elijah act so irrationally. Where you read in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 3, it says here, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And then 1 Kings 9, chapter 19, verse 4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So firstly we find that, well, what I take from this verse is that in verse 3, he is so scared that he even leaves his servant, not telling his servant where he is going to, and then goes for an extra day's journey into the wilderness, so that nobody, absolutely nobody knows where he is. So you see, his trust in other people is completely shattered. Not only that, but then he has lost so much faith, so much hope. His world has come crashing down. He has this utter feeling of hopelessness. And he's even saying to God, Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So how can a man who has experienced such miracles, who has walked with the Lord so closely, have a moment of such irrational fear? If we look at another example, Job, we find that even in his day of affliction and darkness, he declared himself, let the day perish wherein I was born. And God himself declared to Satan, when we read the book of Job, that Job was a man after his own heart. So, how is it that this happens? You know, in all our lives, there comes the experience of disappointment and discouragement. In every single person, there are days when, there is, when the sorrow is so bad that we just don't know how to interact with that sorrow. And it's hard to believe, I think, sometimes that, that God is even still there. We have these questions, is God still my benefactor? Is God still out there looking after me? And we start having these questions. Especially when the trouble starts to harass us. And I'd like to read this. It says from a book called Review and Herald. It is at such times that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt. The bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual sight the meaning of God's providences? We should see Angels of God seeking to save us from ourselves. I like that. It takes me back to the story of, once again, Elijah, but this time with Gehazi, where they were in the city and they were surrounded. And Gehazi could see no way out. 
He could see no way out from the soldiers because the soldiers had completely surrounded them and was looking for them. But he had no spiritual sight. And that's when God allowed him for a brief moment in time to have the spiritual sight to see angels. And when he saw that, he saw that there was actually angels surrounding him and Elijah around the entire city, between them and the soldiers. Now many times, we don't have, none of us have the spiritual sight. But we are urged by the Bible to have it through faith. We must believe that God is doing everything in our best interest to ensure that we overcome during a particular point in time. However, our decision-making ability, our ability to rationalize properly under stress is severely hampered. And we make decisions such as Elijah. We make decisions such as Job. We find it so utterly hopeless that we just pray to God and say, Lord, just take my life right now because I see no other way out of this. Now, just for a brief just for a brief time to digress, just on, you know, depression. The world, South Africa now, is plagued with depression. Many of it, or much of it, is well placed. We live in a stressful time. We are so bombarded with media, with issues at work. In fact, it used to be that you couldn't be reached at home. Right now you have cell phones, you have laptops, you have all this electronic media where you are wired 24-7 to produce. And there's this continual force that says you have to produce constantly. And there's an expectation that it happens. And we give in to that expectation many times. So many times we are the drivers of our own depressive states. Now, depression as, as a whole is, is, is a complicated disease. It has many uh, factors that gives rise to it. There's chemical factors, environmental, biological. And many times, we self-diagnose. You know, a famous thing is we go to Dr. Google and then we read the list and when we see, oh, one, two, three, four, five, ah, I'm depressed. And then we go out and say, well, I'm depressed. We have not had a clinical or physical exam. We've not gone to a trained practitioner. We've self-diagnosed these types of things. And you know what? Many times we speak these things into existence. The Bible, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart. So easy. So if we are going to go around saying, I am depressed. I've looked at the signs. I've checked the signs out. Therefore, I am. You will be. For example, many times the signs of depression can be through other things, but we put it on ourselves. For example, if we feel like crying more than normal, if we have this sense of hopelessness, if our sleeping patterns change, if we are less motivated at some times, if we are more anxious and stressed, if we think that life is not worth living and if we're not functioning well. Now, many times if these types of feelings are not brought on by some sort of situational trauma and they just start manifesting themselves, then I would urge you, go and get this checked out professionally. But please do not self-diagnose because if you do start self-diagnose, you will start putting yourself into these types of depressive states, which is... Not a good thing in the first place. Now, taking that type of consideration, we look at Elijah, we find that his life was threatened. He feared for his life, no doubt, that's why he ran. But we find that he was so focused on his circumstances. He was so focused on his immediate environment and the message that he received from the messenger that he, in the end, he lost all hope, that he just wanted to die. And he became so depressed 
So why would he make such an irrational decision when he saw the providences of God? Where does this come from? Number one, he was so self-focused. He was focusing on it so much that as Proverbs says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so easy, he brought it on himself. But to do this, it means your decision-making ability, your processes for rational thought needs to be affected. And I want to put it down to you that many times it's because of our frontal lobe. The reason why we become like this, the reason why we have poor decision making, the reason why we have this inability to think rationally is because our frontal lobe. Now our frontal lobe is situated here, the prefrontal cortex. It's the seat of our will, it's the seat of our moral turpitude, it's the seat of our decision making, it's the seat of our self-control. So the frontal lobe decides the higher order passions. It doesn't give in to the base passions. That's the limbic system. So the limbic system is responsible for, I want to eat now. I want to sleep now. You know, those, those, those types of things. Amygdala is more, the amygdala is more with regards to the fears and the fear memories and those types of things. But your, your prefrontal cortex, your frontal lobe is where you make decisions, is how you think through things. Now, just a little bit of science, and I think this is where we need to also understand the science. We need to understand what actually happens to our frontal lobes when we go through a decision-making process, and we need to understand what hampers our decision-making ability during these times. For example, studies have found that depressed patients actually have a 60% decrease in blood flow to the frontal lobe. Now we all know that the only way in which your brain can get nourished is through the blood system. It carries nutrients, it takes away toxins, so if there's a 60% decrease in blood flow to your frontal lobe, what is that going to mean for your ability to make rational decisions? Not only that, but it's also been shown that where we increase blood flow to the frontal lobe, the functioning of the frontal lobe becomes improved and the functioning of the frontal lobe starts becoming to work optimally. So we need to understand that whatever hampers blood flow to the frontal lobe is going to hamper our ability to make good decisions. Also, when we go through these feelings of hopelessness and depressions and we feel like we just want to die and we feel like there's nothing else in the world that can help us, we need to understand that all that type of thinking has an effect on the actual brain. It's found, it's been found that when you have that type of thinking, when you start going into these types of depressive states, when you start having these types of thoughts of hopelessness, when you start having these thoughts that there's nothing else that can help you in this world, your brain physically starts to shrink. The gray matter, in fact, it's been found that the hippocampus starts to shrink. Now, the hippocampus is involved in both long-term and short-term memory. So, where it starts to shrink, what do you think that's going to start to mean for yourself in terms of your long and your short-term memory? When we speak of the amygdala, now, Previously I said that your amygdala is basically the seat where you store all your emotions and especially your fear-related memories. Especially when we have these issues of hopelessness and depressive states and where we see nothing, we, we, we can't see the wood for the trees. Our amygdala starts going into overdrive. What does that mean? We start producing more fear-related memories. Now, normally in cases where our frontal lobe is acting 100%, the frontal lobe is the brakes for the amygdala. But what we find, or what science has found, is that during 
bouts of depression or depressive states or this utter hopelessness that people just go through with, that they, sometimes they even bring on themselves. The amygdala goes into overdrive, fear dominates, and your frontal lobe starts to shrink. So now your life becomes dominated by fear of the unknown. Your life becomes dominated by not knowing what is going to happen less tomorrow or the next day. And that inability to understand what's going to happen next fills you with so much dread, fills you with so much fear that you can't make proper decisions. So I hope you now start to see the link between the frontal lobe and making decisions in times of stress. And why I said it's so important that we need to place our trust where it should be on the Lord Himself. Now, why is the frontal lobe so important? You see, when this part of the brain is adversely affected, either through injury or through what we ourselves do to the brain, we find that our concentration as a whole starts to decrease. We find that there's a lack of foresight. I can't think things through. I can't see the end from the beginning. So I can't understand what's going to happen. I, I, I have this issue where I can't restrain myself anymore. Those proper impulse control mechanisms are decreased in a person whose frontal lobe is deficient or depressed. Not only that, but we also find that, pardon me, your morality starts to decrease. Your inclination for spiritual things as a whole starts to decrease. You become inattentive as a whole on anything. A good frontal lobe prevents us from actually acting in a deviant way. <coughs> Pardon me. I was actually reading where they had done a study on prisoners. And what they found is that each and every prisoner that had committed some sort of egregious act, be it thievery, be it murder, be it rape, be it whatever the case may be. What they found was that each and every single prisoner had a depressed frontal lobe, had a deficiency of some sort, be it chemical, be it brought on by themselves, but they had a depressed frontal lobe. So what does that mean when we making decisions that are not wholesome? It means that we are bringing it upon ourselves, that we are making those decisions because our frontal lobe as a whole is not working correctly. Another thing which people don't seem to understand is that this part of the brain continues to grow for the first 30 years of your life. So anything that you introduce during those first 30 years of your life that is going to impact it negatively is going to ensure that the frontal lobe itself becomes deficient and deviant. Now, you might be asking yourself right now, so what are the types of issues that affect the frontal lobe? Number one, and we'll go through some of these issues that affect the frontal lobe and that impact poor decision making, especially under stress. And maybe then we can gain some understanding as to why we make decisions that sometimes when we look back at those decisions, we say, but my goodness, why did I ever do that? Why did I decide to do that? Or we look at the behavior of others and we ask ourselves, but that didn't seem like the right decision to do at the time. Why would they have done that? Once you understand what affects the frontal lobe, and we're going to speak a little bit about that now, you'll gain that understanding to see that we are actually doing a lot negatively to impact the functioning of our frontal lobe. A poor diet. I think one of the biggest things when it comes to poor diet, and if we must speak on poor diet, we could go, I could go on for another maybe two or three hours. But one of the most important things that a poor diet, especially people, or especially most of us, that have oxidized cholesterol in our foods, 
What we don't understand is that when we eat and consume oxidized cholesterol, that actually directly damages brain cells and it leads to brain cell death, especially within the frontal lobe. So when you have increased amounts or any amount of oxidized cholesterol, it starts killing the brain cells in the frontal lobe. So the question is, what is oxidized cholesterol? It's essentially those types of mixtures, especially the mixtures between milk and eggs and sugar. When you start having those types of combinations, you start converting them to oxidized cholesterol. Now, that's not the only type of, of oxidized cholesterol. We can take in other forms as well, but those are the more prevalent types that we take in. So you can think of all the combinations of milk, sugar and eggs that you can take in. Those things we need to limit. Those things need to be for Christmas. The unfortunate part is that we have Christmas every single day. In fact, we have Christmas three times a day. Many of us, we will have these types of rewards for ourselves, for doing well, or for speaking well, or our children were good, and we we give them a treat. But many times when we give them these treats, we don't realize that this oxidized cholesterol has a tremendous effect on our brain cells. So, I would urge you, have Christmas once a year, not every day. Another factor of a poor diet that leads to cognitive decrease, especially cognitive decline, is high sugar diets. There's too much sugar in our diets. There's too much free sugar in our diets. We need to limit this. Because too much sugar directly once again affects the frontal lobe. It starts with cognitive decline and it increases to memory decline. A high fat diet has been shown that it leads to decreased growth factor in the frontal lobe. And then lastly, an excessively high meat diet has actually been found to decrease the electrical activity of the frontal lobe and increase the electrical activity in the limbic system. So, I spoke about that earlier. Your limbic system is your impulses and your passions. So you think about it. If my frontal lobe is decreased and my limbic system is increased, that means a, I'll have a, a moral perception decrease and I'll have an increase in my animal passions. Is it any wonder, in terms of when you look out in the world today, how many people are making types of decisions that are not ethical, that are not moral, that have no integrity, but it just satisfies their animal passions. Many times we bring it on through our diet. Many times we bring it on by what we're doing. Not all the times, but many times we can curb what we are putting into our bodies. So, how do we start looking at this from a, from a different perspective? How do we find to get ourselves out of this, how do we increase our ability of our frontal lobe to start thinking better, to start acting better under stress? Well, number one, sleep. If you look at the, the first Kings chapter 19, one of the first things that God did to Elijah is he made him rest. Well, first he made him run and then he made him rest. And the reason for this is that we as human beings in this fast-paced world, we have insufficient sleep. We're supposed to get between 7 and 9 hours of sleep every single day. What we find is that many people are surviving on 4 to maybe 5 hours of sleep every single day. What this happens, what this means is that when we have insufficient sleep, we actually start building up inflammatory compounds inside of our bodies. And the more free radicals that is produced as a result of this, the more cellular stress happens in the body. This leads to immune system um, depression, but it also leads to cell death. All because we don't have sufficient sleep and we don't have the right type of sleep. It's not just resting. 
It's not just uh, it's not just resting from your duties. It's having quality sleep. Seven to nine hours each and every night. Then there's another issue when it comes to sleep. And what they found is that one hour, one hour of decreased sleep per night has a 37% increase in, the, in, 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 in your risk of getting high blood pressure. So here we find that if you don't have enough um, sleep, you actually start affecting your body processes. Right? Not only from a frontal lobe perspective, but from your, your other body processes as well. Then, sleep deprivation affects the prefrontal cortex to such a, a bad um, extent that your judgment, as well as your healthy thought patterns, start becoming disorientated. They actually found that when you don't sleep, well, I think anybody can attest to this, that when you don't have enough sleep, you don't make proper judgment calls. You don't make proper um, you, you have faulty thinking patterns, all because you're not getting enough rest. So number one, I would urge you that if you have these types of things, if you can see that you're not making proper decisions, you're not thinking rationally, your spirituality is declining, your need or your moral turpitude is declining, start getting enough rest. Another thing is human touch. You see, we live in such a world where Satan wants us to believe that we exist in a vacuum. Even through this coronavirus, we are now all self-isolating in South Africa, inside of our own homes. But many of us self-isolate ourselves in normal life. We come, we've come to such a time and place whereby we believe that it's me, myself and I. That we don't want to believe that anybody else can, can, can help me, can assist me, or can build us up spiritually, or physically, or mentally. So what do we do? We go it alone. And what, the, what we found is that when we take away that human contact with others, when we take away that touch, we start building up this pressure inside that too much cortisol is produced as a result of the stress that we bring upon ourselves. Now, we're living in a world where Satan wants to alienate each and every one of us. Satan wants to believe that we are an island. And as a result of that, our bodies are experiencing stress. We are social creatures by nature. We need to belong and we have a sense of belonging. But we've been led to believe that in this world, nobody is going to help you. And Satan has proven that over and over and again through all his interpretations that is put on, 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 on mankind. All of these things have shown that he doesn't care for us. That he wants to isolate us. But one of the biggest factors that actually reduces stress that reduces cortisol in the body is human touch. Hugging a loved one. Just being close to somebody. You know, unfortunately, during this time of self-isolation, we found that gender-based violence has increased to such an extent that we've gone to an extreme now where we have to inflict pain on those around us. The very people that could actually provide us with a safety net, we are hurting. So, Satan is at work. Satan is thriving in this. And what we need to understand is that healthy human interaction, healthy human touch is what is needed to reduce stress. That's why we should definitely give rise to hugging your spouse each and every day. Hug your children. It's, I once read a study where they said, us as fathers, we have become so busy in this technocratic world that literally it's been found we spend 30 seconds in conversation with our children every single day. 
maximum. Now, I mean, how can a child ever survive in this world with 30 seconds from their parent? I find that strange to believe. So I'm making a concerted effort to hug my children more, to have conversations with them, to have them on the lap, to just talk to them. We need to do this. We don't realize that we are robbing them, we are robbing ourselves of a factor to decrease stress. Now, just on this thing of stress, when you have too much cortisol, it reduces your immunity, it reduces your enzymes in your body, it reduces your neurotransmitters in your body, especially when you are producing cortisol over an extended period of time because we are wired all the time, we are stressed all the time so our body just continues producing this cortisol and it's breaking us down, it's breaking down our immunity it's depressing our neurotransmitters, it's depressing our enzyme activity but a simple hug, a simple hug, a simple rub, a simple massage has been shown to start reducing cortisol and start increasing serotonin in the body. Now, serotonin and dopamine, those are your feel-good hormones. Those are your, your natural antidepressants. And Satan is robbing us of that by making us believe that we don't need to have this type of interactions. Another thing that we are robbing ourselves of is good exercise. What we don't understand is that exercise actually affects your prefrontal cortex or your frontal lobe in an excellent way. It improves, number one, blood flow. And we found that people that are depressed or people that are feeling um, extreme anxiety or, or, or hopelessness, they have decreased blood flow. One of the best ways to increase it is through moderate exercise. And I stress moderate because once we start performing high stress exercises on our body you know these extreme um, workouts these these extreme um, exercises where we take our bodies to the limits it's actually been found that that increases something called catecholamines especially epinephrine now catecholamines are produced um, in your adrenal glands they are those stress hormones um, well they are a family of hormones, they epinephrine, no epinephrine, dopamine, all of this, but especially during high stress exercise acti activities, epinephrine is produced and it shoots throughout the entire body. When your body has too much epinephrine, it starts to make microscopic holes in your DNA. And it all comes through us doing these extreme exercise activities. Whereas, if you produce or if you, if you go into moderate exercise activities, such as brisk walking, hiking, those type of activities, it actually decreases anxiety by 20%. It then also has been found that it decreases suicide idealization and attempts for taking one's own life by 23%, especially in teenagers. So we find here that it starts affecting the frontal lobe in a very positive way. It takes away the feelings of hopelessness. It takes away that feeling that I need to take my life, that, I, that I'm anxious, that I'm stressed, all through proper exercise and moderate exercise. And it's been shown that you can't just do this type of exercise once in a blue moon. This needs to be sustained exercise 20, 30 minutes each and every single day. In fact, I'm just reading one of the studies that I, uh, that I did my notes on here. Just five minutes of walking or brisk hiking or even gardening starts increasing your dopamine levels and it starts giving you a sense of well-being. Just five minutes of exercise already starts to have this effect. Imagine if we all had to undertake an exercise program of 20 to 30 minutes each and every day. Imagine the type of of world we would live in. If people were more healthier, 
fitter. Not only would they be fitter and there'd be less um, issues of disease, but we'd have better frontal, prefrontal cortexes. Now, on this point, there's some things that also we need to understand when it comes to um, what affects the frontal lobe. Now, I already said exercise affects it. We already spoke a little bit about the, the blood flow, about the faulty thinking patterns and having correct thinking patterns. We spoke about sleep. I want to pause for a moment and just talk about what we also do to depress the frontal lobe through drugs. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about the hardcore drugs, even though that severely depresses the frontal lobe. I'm talking about the legal drugs, the cigarettes, the alcohol, and to a large extent, the caffeine. In fact, let me, let, let me just speak a little bit about what factors or neurological factors caffeine brings uh, to this whole frontal lobe discussion that we're having right now. Our cells are made to work. Our cells don't have a brain of their own. So what the body does is that when a cell starts to get tired, it doesn't know that it must switch off. So the body produces some hormones. Uh, the body produces adenosine. And it shoots out adenosine. Adenosine locks onto the cells and it says, you need to shut down. You're tired. You're going to burn yourself out. You're going to die if you don't stop. So adenosine is the brakes. The body pushes out the adenosine and these are the brakes of the body. However, caffeine mimics this adenosine and it blocks the adenosine receptors on the cell. So that when your cell is working over time and you're drinking caffeine, caffeine then fits into those receptors, but caffeine does the opposite of adenosine. The caffeine starts to accelerate. So now, because I'm drinking coffee, it gives me that initial surge of energy, but what I don't know is that now my cells start working overtime. And they don't know that they are tiring out and burning out. And after a while, it causes cell death, especially in my prefrontal cortex. All because I'm having increased amounts of caffeine in my body. There's, there's, a, there's a number of, of, of neurotransmitters that is affected through regular caffeine use. I just want to pause for a moment and talk about four. Um, number one, there's a neurotransmitter that, that is called GABA. Now GABA is the one that facilitates calmness in the body. So when you're feeling stressed, your body shoots out GABA and it calms you down. It helps you to, to basically focus under stress. It helps you to be calm when that traumatic experience happens. Then there's another um, hormone that I'd like to talk about, and that is acetylcholine. Because now acetylcholine improves your ability to be attentive. It improves your ability to be alert under stress. Then there's dopamine. Dopamine is basically your feel-good hormone. Then the serotonin, very important, it's your natural antidepressant. But also, serotonin is the hormone that affects your self-control. It affects your ability to say yes or say no. And then the last one is norepinephrine, which is basically a natural antidepressant that shoots through the body. Caffeine affects all four of these neurotransmitters. So... It interferes with GABA production. In fact, it decreases GABA production. It decreases acetylcholine. It decreases norepinephrine. It decreases serotonin. So think about that now. With increased caffeine usage, you've, in, you've decreased the body's responsiveness to issues under extreme stress. So now... You can't be calm under stress anymore. You can't 
focus on the stress anymore. You're not that alert anymore. You're not that focused. You've lost concentration. You become heightened in your depressive state. You no longer have a positive mood or a positive outlook. And your self-control is severely effective. So imagine you have a traumatic event happen. Imagine you have an angry moment. Is it no wonder that we finding in the world all these events, road rage, and those types of things where people for no reason starts acting out, for, for children for no reason, starts acting out where they start becoming so violent for no reason. And we find this, especially in the youth of today. And we ask ourselves, but why? For what reason? Why are people becoming so short-tempered? Why, if I look at someone the wrong way, does that person want to attack or hurt? One, their self-control completely goes down. Their positive outlook on life goes down. Their focus under stress goes down. So now you start thinking chaotically. You can't, you, you, you can't have coherent thoughts anymore. All because we've increased caffeine. And we've done it subtly with children. So we're starting to have them drink more energy drinks. We're starting to give them more cocoa, more Milo, more chocolate even. All of these things contain caffeine. And the thing is, this builds up over time. And it starts affecting these neurotransmitters all the time time. So much so that we can't even criticize or have a critical conversation with someone without them getting extremely angry. Oh, and that is the other thing um, that, that, that caffeine does. Increased caffeine usage has been shown to lower the threshold for anger and impatience. So now we're becoming a more angry society, we're becoming a more impatient society and our frontal lobe is completely being shot because of what we are taking in through these legal drugs. And I think the last thing is that when we have too much caffeine, it slows our response time during complex situations. So now I can't think as fast as I could have if I did not have this, 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 this legal drug in my body. It makes one think that if caffeine is a drug today, <clears throat> if it was just found yesterday, would caffeine actually be passed as a drug? I was just thinking about that. Mm, something to ponder on. Because of all the stuff that it actually does, it affects your frontal lobe the worst out of most of these legal drugs. So, Lack of sleep affects your frontal lobe. Lack of exercise affects your frontal lobe. Poor nutrition, as we found out, affects your frontal lobe. Poor habits, when it comes to these types of legal drugs, affects your frontal lobe. Even something as innocent as TV watching affects your frontal lobe. They've done studies on this, where they found that <coughs> our brains, our frontal lobe, can can only compare reality with fiction if the image that we are seeing on the screen is longer than three seconds. If the image that we are seeing is less than three seconds, it's as if the brain or the frontal lobe goes into a semi hip or it experiences a semi-hypnotic episode whereby the body or the frontal lobe can't tell the difference between reality and fiction. And if we are truthful to ourselves, most of the shows, most of the series, most of the movies that we watch, everything takes less than three seconds. I mean, you watch these action movies, you watch these, um, these cartoons, you watch these animation movies, all those figures on the screen change less than three seconds. They found that this does not happen. Your mind does not go into a semi-hypnotic state. Your mind does not go into this 
can't tell fact from reality if we are watching nature programs and if we are watching documentaries where the scenes take long to change, where the scenes are more natural and where the scenes take their time to change. They haven't found that effect. They've only found that effect when we start watching these things where it starts changing every three seconds. So I'd like you to evaluate your TV watching. See, in fact, how often that screen and that image starts to change, be it cartoons, uh, be it documentaries, uh, be it movies, be it series, be it whatever the case may be. And we must understand we have been a break in um, broadcast. Anyway, we're back now. Everything seems to be back and running. As I was saying, we need to evaluate what we're watching because the more we watch, the more we're affecting our prefrontal and the more we allow our children to partake of these types of things, the more we are affecting their frontal lobe, the more we are putting them into a semi-hypnotic state. We need to evaluate these things from a serious perspective. We are becoming more angry. And when we become more angry, the one thing I forgot to mention is that one minute of anger, there, was a stu there were studies done on this. Well, I was reading a study that was done, in fact. One minute of anger suppresses you. As I was saying, another break in broadcast. I'm sorry about that. I think it's the rain and the cloud cover that is causing all the breaks in transmission. But what we found, or what science has found, is that one minute of anger suppresses your immune system for up to six hours. Now imagine all become so distressed all because of anger and we don't realize that that anger is suppressing our immune system throughout the day. So, as I end, we need to understand that our sleep patterns affect our, our eating patterns affect our frontal lobe. In fact, there's, there's this massive debate going on in science right now between complex carbohydrate meal plans and low carb diets. There was a study done at MIT where they found that when you when you have low carb diets, you actually your body actually slows down production of serotonin. And we know that serotonin is a natural positive mood enhancer. So it increases your self control. So imagine your serotonin level starts decreasing. It means that you're becoming a more morose person. You're putting yourself into a depressive state. And that's one of the issues from a, a low-carb diet, where there's a high-carb diet. And when I say high-carb, I mean complex carbohydrates. I'm not talking about refined carbohydrates. In fact, if we go to the shops, it would do us well that when we shop for ingredients, we should shop for ingredients or we should shop for items that have one, that has one ingredient listed. So, you go for potatoes, lentils, beans, those types of things. The more natural, the better. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about complex carbohydrate diets. That has been shown to actually increase the body's absorption of tryptophan to make more serotonin to enhance your mood. So, we find this dichotomy of studies and I'd urge you well to have a proper proper diet to fix your frontal lobe, exercise program, better sleep, better attitude in life and through all of these things we will be able to have better decision making under stress because what we find is that <clears throat> most of the decision making out there is irrational, it's fear based and it could all be due, or most of it could be due, because people making those decisions have depressed or deficient frontal lobes. So as I close in prayer, I ask you that for this week ahead, you survey your habits and you ask God to assist you to, to start taking away those habits that is destroying the body, that is destroying the mind, that is destroying the ability of the brain to make proper decisions. Shall we close our eyes in prayer? Lord, we ask you this day to help us. We are all struggling, Lord Jesus. We all make imperfect decisions. We all make irrational choices at times, Lord. But help us to get our frontal lobe in a, into a state 
whereby we can start making proper decisions. Help us to have better sleep. Help us to have better exercise. Help us to have proper diet, Lord Jesus. Help us to have a positive outlook in life. Help us to start taping, start to stop taking all these legal drugs. Help us, Lord Jesus, in every aspect of our lives. Even touch. Help us to have better social relationships, better familial relationships, better spousal relationships, Lord Jesus. Help us in every aspect of our lives so that we can glorify you through our bodies. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.